Cabinet and the National Coronavirus Command Council to uh, appraise the whole of South Africa what are the regulations that will apply under alert level 3. As we all know, these regulations come after the President addressed the nation on Sunday with regard to all of us and the entire country uh, <clears throat> proceeding from level 4 to level 3 come the 1st of June, Monday, this coming Monday. Uh, having said that, I will now request Minister Kosozana Lamine Zuma, the Minister of Cocta, to come and speak to all of us on the regulations. Minister Lamine Zuma. Colleagues, members of the media, and compatriots, 84 days have lapsed since the first reported case of COVID-19 on our shores. From that day onwards, led by the steady hand of the President, we have put in place measures to contain the spread of the virus and save lives and try and flatten the curve. These measures have been coordinated by Cabinet with the advice and inputs of various command centers from the three spheres of government. All these levels and spheres have greatly benefited from the inputs of various experts and scientists, including those that serve in the Minister of Health Advisory Committee on the Coronavirus. Our efforts have been directed by consultations we have had with various sectors and constituencies in our country, including local government, provinces, traditional leaders, religious leaders, NEDLEG, private sector, and many others. We have also benefited from the overwhelming support we have received from all South Africans. Ordinary South Africans from all walks of life, political persuasions, religious convictions, and cultural backgrounds from all races and classes have largely heeded the call to stay at home, practice hygiene measures such as washing of hands, maintaining social distance, and wearing of masks. These simple but effective measures are the most important ammunition in our fight against COVID-19 in the absence of a cure or vaccine. We have also been encouraged by the recognition of solidarity and activism by millions of South Africans who, through acts of kindness, have ensured that those who are less fortunate have food, they are cared for, and have access to masks and sanitizers. Indeed, we have confirmed ourselves as a great and resilient nation in Ubuntu. The measures of a great nation is how it treats the weakest and not the strongest, as once said by Matiba. Thanks to our sacrifice and contribution, we have managed to flatten the curve. But unfortunately, our figures are still rising and the peak is still in the horizon. As we migrate the country into alert level 3, as announced by the President, with some hot spots, we must redouble our efforts so as to further contain and prevent deaths. These next phases of our fight and level three allow us, allows us to open 
all the productive sectors of our economy, albeit to a moderate degree in some high-risk sectors. This risk level, thanks to the employ of the risk-adjusted strategy, allows us to maintain the delicate balance act, balancing act between, on one hand, saving lives, on the other, the livelihoods of South Africans. It also requires greater responsibility and discipline from all of us as citizens of our resilient nation. All of us individually and severally have the responsibility not only to protect ourselves, but to protect the next person. Consequently, at this alert level, Everyone who enters a workplace, public space, and or public transport must wear a mask. Preferably a cloth mask or even a homemade item that covers the nose and mouth. We must also ensure that at all our public facilities, there are sanitizers and that all the patrons are screened. This coming phase also confirms prevention as a cornerstone of our response. It is only healthy communities and individuals that can drive our recovery plan on the other side of the infection curve. We must also remain cognizant of the ever-present danger of reversing the gains we have thus far recorded. In fact, the risk of a massive increase in the infections is now greater than it has been since the alert of the, out, the start of the outbreak in our country, to quote the President. Compatriots, as we have said before, our risk adjusted strategy is also based on a combination of sound scientific advice and benchmarking against international experience. These experiences and the WHO confirm the effectiveness of the measures such as the lockdown. However, given our socio-economic conditions, we've had to ease restrictions. Thus, in the employ of the risk-adjusted strategy, we have subjected each province and district or metro to its own level of the risk alert system. This will assist us in mounting coordinated and targeted in interventions, especially in the deployment of our limited resources. Nonetheless, as per the announcement of the President, we will move the whole country of South Africa to risk level three which implies certain adjustments to our Level 4 regulations. However, our state of national lockdown continues until such time that we have flattened the curve for a sustainable period. In this regard, our differentiated approach and risk levels will be directed by the advice we will receive from the Minister of Health and inputs from WHO ministerial advisory experts and various cabinet ministers. These levels are applicable at a provincial level, all metropolitan areas and district within that province, unless a differentiated alert level is explicitly determined as a hotspot. And Compatriots will remember that the President did mention the areas that are deemed as hotspots. So as we usher Level 3, which will apply nationally from the 1st of June this year, the following areas are declared as hotspots. 
Tswane, Johannesburg, Kurulene, Teguini, Nelson Mandela, Buffalo City, Cape Town, West Coast Overbeck, Cape Winelands District, Krisani District in the Eastern Cape, Ilembe District in Guazulu Natal. And what that means is that the Minister of Health may advise more stringent measures in some parts in those areas, depending on the spread of the virus. So far, we have only identified potential spots and we are doing all we can to change the fortunes of those areas. In the event that our collective efforts bear little or no fruit, such an area will require added efforts, including subjecting it to higher level restrictions, including the limitation of movements within and to and fro hotspots. In the areas that are not hotspots, we will allow movement within the district and localities. Permit movement to work, to buy, obtain goods and services for medical attention, for exercise. The limitation on movements across provinces and now between metropolitans and districts and hotspots may be prohibited, except for persons traveling for the purpose of starting work, moving to a new residence, or caring for an immediate family member, and also attending funerals as it has been before, or going for work or business that is allowed under level three. Given that schools will open in a phased approach, there will also be open travel between provinces and districts for pupils, students and teachers. As, as we know, some of them live at the border of provinces and they have to commute pretty much every day. As said by the President, we will lift the curfew and allow more time for exercise, walking and cycling. However, this is permitted as long as this is not done in organized groups. In this regard, health protocols and social distancing must be strictly observed, including wearing of masks. Public training, fitness and recreational facilities remain closed except those conducting non-contact sport matches without spectators. The Minister of Arts and Culture and Sports will elaborate on this. Workplace gatherings for work purposes will be permitted under strict conditions and in the observation of health hygiene and social distancing protocols. Employers must ensure that the 1.5 meter distance is maintained amongst employees. We will have to limit the number of people in the workplace so that we minimize the chances of infection or take other measures to ensure that social distancing is observed. In minimizing the chances of infection on the consumption places for food, entertainment and recreation will remain closed. These will include places such as restaurants, shippings, taverns, nightclubs, bars, cinemas, theaters, faiths, bazaars, casinos or similar places. But as you know, food will be available from restaurants, from takeaway places, um, only for collection 
or delivery, but not for sit down. As will hotels, lodges, and basically all accommodation facilities will remain closed except for confined tourists who may have been locked down and are still in those places or for quarantine and isolation but also since we have opened uh, the economy for people who are traveling for business and work and the minister of tourism will elaborate with regards to funerals at level three we'll continue to limit the interprovincial travel for the purpose of attending funerals those permitted to travel will be legal spouses partners of the disease children and grandchildren of the deceased whether they are biological adopted stepchildren or foster children children parents of the deceased whether biological adopted step parents and foster parents siblings whether biological adopted or step brothers and sisters and of course grandparents indeed the virus has challenged our ways as a society and our various cultures this is a time when we should all join in meditation in fellowship and prayer consequently as the president said we will have a national day of prayer which will be on sunday but this will be praying at home or virtual uh, through virtual means we have also widely consulted with religious sectors led by our president and are now in a position to categorize religious counseling as an essential service this will enable the millions who have been affected by this virus to receive this such needed service since the majority cannot afford professional attention on this of this nature a religious gathering such as places in places of worship will be allowed from the 1st of june so long as health hygiene and social distancing is observed this means that we must maintain 1.5 meters between the worshipers and the maximum of 20 congregants should be chosen should the chosen venue be able to accommodate such if indeed the venue is too small to accommodate 50 people at 1.5 meters apart it means there will be less congregants in that venue must also they must also be wearing masks and sanitizing of hands and no contact and they must also be screening when people arrive at the place so that those who may be who may be have be having symptoms may be sent for testing or medical attention our lived experience have shown that funerals side covid-19 transmission vessels consequently we will continue to limit the number of funeral attendees to 50 provided the transportation hygiene health and social distancing protocols and guidelines are observed 
the station commanders of all police stations or a, ch a person charged by them will keep meticulous records with regard to the funerals and number of people attending. Recent experience, particularly in the Western Cape and Eastern Cape and Limpopo, show that interprovincial travel has contributed to community transmission. Consequently, travel between the provinces is not permitted with the exception of those possessing a permit to attend a funeral or conduct essential services between our provinces and districts or are going there for work or business and they will have permits workers and those who are going there for business will have permits from their employers. The big challenge about interprovincial travel is really the fact that the economic hubs, which have the majority of the people, are also, on the whole, the ones that have more infections. And so it's important that when people come to these places for work, they don't then commute every weekend to go to another province because they may be transmitting or taking the virus. As we know, the virus doesn't move, it's moved by people. So that is the reason why we have to still limit interprovincial travel. Our international ports of entry remain closed except for those designated by the Minister of Home Affairs to undertake the transportation of fuel and cargo for humanitarian operations, repatriation or evacuations of medical for medical emergencies, movements for international organizations that may be deemed uh, important, but also South Africans still coming back home and foreigners leaving the country. And also those who may be coming back to study as the schools open or coming back to work who work in South Africa but live in other uh, neighboring countries. So the Minister of Home Affairs will indeed uh, give directions in that area. In order to ensure smooth movement of employees and as a measure of careful and gradual opening of our economy, we will also permit um, domestic air travel at a date that will be determined by the Minister of Transport. And of course, interprovincial cargo for carrying imports, exports, and goods manufactured in South Africa will continue and the Minister of Transport will make announcements but the health protocols still have to be kept. And amongst those returning to work are all public servants with the exception of those who have permission to conduct work from home. And of course, as we announced right from level five, that those who are 60 and above, and those who have other illnesses, who have comorbidities, are encouraged to stay at home and only go out if it's absolutely necessary. And preferably if they have to work, work at home because the mortality rate in those groups is much higher than in the lower groups. This provision also uh, means that local government can and will operate close to full operation. Consequently, 
council meetings can take place, but under strict health protocols and social distancing. And directions will be issued in this regard. Given the potential to further transmissions, we will continue to ask public engagements, such as these in BIZOs, ITP consultations, to continue to be done virtually or by electronic or broadcast platforms as we are currently doing. The various associations and businesses have also uh, developed industry-specific guidelines. However, recent experience, particularly in some of the areas that were open earlier, like mining, direct us to strengthen these in consultation with various industries. So what it means is that every company must have a COVID plan and a COVID uh, compliance officer. And that plan must be known not only by the employer, but the employees. And that plan should be available when inspectors come or anyone comes to see and must be adhered to. And it's important because if those plans are not adhered to and COVID starts spreading in the company, the company will have to close. So it's for the protection both of the company and of the jobs uh, that company uh, offers. Compatriots, when we embarked on this journey, we did say it would not be smooth sailing. We will have to adjust our plans as we gain and gather more experience. COVID-19 has hit hard on all South Africans, particularly those who are vulnerable and homeless. We have mounted a response, but we cannot afford to have many more in the streets. To this end, we will continue to make sure that those who are homeless under level three are still kept in shelters. However, given the rental income is also an important livelihood stream for some who have inserted the possibility of a competent court to grant an eviction order provided it is just and equitable. The sale of tobacco, tobacco products, e-cigarettes and related products remain prohibited for this period, except when they are destined for the export market. The sale of liquor in licensed premises will now be permitted as of the 1st of June for the limited period between Monday and Thursday from 9 a.m. to 1700 hours. However, on-site consumption is prohibited and e-commerce sales will be permitted subject to the same on-site trade days and times. The Minister of Trade industry and competition will elaborate in this regard. Suffice to say, no special or event liquor licenses will be issued for the duration of this period. In opening the economy, we must maintain a firm eye on our goal of flattening the curve, minimizing the rates of infection and deaths. We must remain conscious of the ever-present danger that we can quickly reverse our gains if we act too hastily or irresponsibly. To this end, the operating sectors of our economy must pay 
attention to strict health, hygiene, and social distancing measures, as I have said. We must also secure the livelihoods of our citizens. The social and economic measures we have implemented have at times not fully reached the intended recipients. Through collaboration and concerted actions, we will better target our interventions so that we see a brighter and a better South Africa beyond the virus. All the measures we have implemented are difficult but necessary. We must endure today so that we can secure the future of this beautiful country. Indeed, everything that government has done and is doing is to make sure that the virus will not have a very devastating effect on our country and that post-COVID people will be there to rebuild their lives and to rebuild South Africa. I thank you. Eangitinje <laughs> A old man, a hollow monga mail. What had her in your tail? Song is a zeal. Ugooty says, I may ugly pizza a band a bazo banale sifo. Nabantu a bazo bulawa. Ille liquiwane. A uguze. Sing as tall, he says, as moen lapo. A bandaba ning. Se benge nwe lulu pupane. Benga sagu azuktola usizo ezbedlel. Ngoba mabe baba ninga kulu. Abantaba kulayo. Babe nga pezu gwe ibedlel. E singaba sengingi. Sibonile kwa manyamazwe. Ugutibe gwenze gani. Abantube shona. I nkulungwa nenge i nkulungwa nenge langa. Sia bonga gega kulu guti. Abantu base mzanzi. Bakumbi silu guti. Baya uuzwa. E, umia lezo. Uguti. Kufunega. Batale makaya. Bapu mekpela. Ngobabe yogwenza logo. Okufanele bagwenza. Sasho ge guti. Sesi puma. Kulu guti sitale makaya. Asizu uvele spumenji. Kuzo fadele spume ganane ganane. Uguze senzu guti le sifo singa pepe teki. Esaka lage sise zinge nle sanu. Manje sise zinge nle sine. Gomsaga wan kujun. Sizo ya e zinge nle statu. Logu ya gwe te zinge nle stata guush gutse speli le li sifu. Empele ni ngogusho kwe ntanganyo yeze mpilo yomtab tangen itablecho bekfanele ngabe sechisa umangabe ne balo sabantu abange nwa ili sifu sesele. Hai sisa kupuga. Kodwa la emzanzi. Sia kiki saga ngane ngane noma ibalo zisa kupuga ngoba. Isimo setu sinzima, isimo somnoto, nesimo sempilo. Ngago gege kwa fanelu guti, sizame uguti, enga ngane, sipege uguti, si kusele impilo za bandu. Kodwa, weli nyikala, 
sipege ukuthi abantu bazophila kanjani ikoke kuthi we umnotho awuvulwe kodwa kancane kancane eh imbonike zizovulwa indawo ezithengisayo ziyavulwa indawo zezimbiwa ziyavulwa indawo eziningi sokusebenza uza kwethu uzokhuluma ngazo ziyavulwa kodwa ekuvuleni kwazo kusho ukuthi kuzofanele ukuthi embonini kube khona indlela yokuthi kuliwa kanjani nalesifo khona embonini abantu mabefika kofanele babhekwe ukuthi abanazo yini impawu zalesifo mabe nazo bangangene emsebenzini baye kadokotela noma bayothesta kwesibili kufanele emsebenzini kwaziwe ukuthi abantu abasondelane bayaqaqana iqanti nengxenye 1.5 meters e izandla ziyagezwa abantu bafaka izinto zokuvikela ifonyo nezinye izinto ngoba uma izimboni zingalilandeli loluhlelo ziyobona sezivalwa ngoba phela isifo masibhebetheka ngapha ekhona embonini kuzofanele ukuthi imboni ivalwe kodwa ke e kukhona indawo e, ezibizwa ngokuthi ama hotspot kusho ukuthi indawo lale sifo sibhebetheka khona kakhulu zona ke sizolulekwa eungqongqoshe wezempilo ukuthi iziphi ezinye izinto imiphi emiyimqathango ezofakwa khona ukuthi kuvinjwe lesifo izwe lonke lizongena esigabeni sesithathu kodwa kulezo ndawo khona kuzoba khona ezinye izinto ungqongqoshe we health wezempilo azositshela ukuthi khona kufanele zithuqiniswa lezo ndawo ke lezo ndawo umongameli azimemezela mayilana ke nokuthi abantu bahamba kanjani abantu sebevumelekile ukuthi bahambe basuke kwenye district baye kwenye bahambe provinsini ngaphandle uma kuyindawo leyo ye hotspot la kuzofakwa khona langenzeka kufakwe ezinye izinto ngaphezu kwalezi ezikile level esithathu abantu kusafanele ukuthi bazi ukuthi kusafanele bahlale ekhaya ngoba lesifo amanana sakhuphuka fanele bahlale ekhaya umuntu aphume ngobazi ukuthi uyaphi uye emsebenzini uye itolo uyokwenza kufanele akwenze uya kadokotela noma mhlambe uya exerciser engalezo sikhathi kodwa isikhathi esiningi ikakhulu laba banemnyake eyamashumi ayisithupha ke yaphezulu nalaba banezifo ezinye ngoba umuntu ezifo nomuntu esifo esinye usuthola i-covid ivama ukuthi yenze umonakalo abantu abaningi abashiya emhlabeni basuke betholele sifo benemnyaka engaphezu kwamashumi ayisithupha noma benezinye izifo okunyeke imncwabo isavunyelwe abantu abamashumi amahlanu njengoba bekunjalwa kashintshi lutho ngemncwabo umusuka kwenye iprovinsi uya kwenye kusafanele ukuthi wenze lokho bekwenziwa uthole imvume njengoba kati kwenzeka okunyeke osekuvunyelwe ukuthi esekuvunyelwe ukuthi uma uhamba ngomsebenzi noma ngebusiness ukwazi ukuya kwenye iprovinsi kodwa kofanele ube nemvume ephuma kumqashi ekhombisayo ukuthi uhamba ngomsebenzi noma uhamba ngebusiness ezokuthutha kusenjalo kufanele ukuthi mawuya kwezokuthutha uqoka isifonyo nomuphuma nje endlini yakho 
kufanele ufake isifonyo emlonyeni nekhala bawuphuma nje eh ungongoshe ke wezokuthutha uzobalula kabanzi eh kuzovulwa futhi nezemidlalo ezithize zingathintani labantu bengathintani mabedlala lo mdlalo ungongoshe wezemidlalo nezamasiko naye uzobalula kakhulu ngalokho enye into esivulwa ebingavuliwe kuqala e ukuthi abantu abafunuki abafisa ukuya eindaweni zokukhonza noma ngaba amasonto noma ngaba amamoski noma ngabe amasinagogue noma ngabe yini indawo yokukhonza sebevunyelwe ukuya kodwa kune kune eto ekufanele ilandelwe kakhulu ngoba siyazi ukuthi indawo zamasonto zezinye indawo lapho lesifo sibebethe kakalula kuzoba khona ke imthetho ebalekile ukufanele izicinwe okuqala ukuthi abantu mabefika lapho kufanele babheke ukuthi abanazo inempawu zalesifo umuntu ente nempawu zalesifo aye kudokotela noma yothesta Zofanele bakezi zandla mabefige sontwini. E guzofuneka uguti bakakane. 1.5 meters njongo bakshiu. Banga tindani. Ngabukoni skati la tindana kona. Izi ndweze nzuwayo e sontwini. Eze nzuguti tindwane kufanele zinge nziki. E akufune uguti kube kona banta banga pezu kwa bashuma masano e sontwini uma leo ndawo ikuvumela ukuthi abantu bangaba mashumi amahlanu baqaqane uma kuyindawo encane engabavumeli ukuthi baba mashumi amahlanu baqaqane kusho ukuthi fanele babe ngaphansi okunye osekuvunyelwe obengavunyelwe utshwala kodwa utshwala kuthi wabuthenge uhambe nabo uyemzini wakho awuvunyelwe ukuphenga uphuzele lapho zonke indawo ezithengisa utshwala zovumela ukuthi zizuphengise nalezo ndawo eziphengisayo ngoko ngesinye isikhathi kuhlalwe phansi akuzuvunyelwa manje ukuthi kuhlalwe phansi noma ngabe usethaven noma ngabe useshipini kufuneka uphenge uphume nabo usavaliwe uhambe nabo uyekhaya uyophuzela khona ikhathi kuzoba umsombuluko kuze kube ulwesine ngolwesihlanu ngomgqibelo ngesonto utshwala uthengiswa ngesikhathi kuzoqala uniholo leshia kalolunye nine ekseni kuze kube ihora lesihlanu dambama emva kwalokho absathengiswa engoba phela siyazi ukuthi bebuvaliwe ngesizathu naleso sizathu asikapheli so iyiko kuthiwa noma buvulwa kodwa abuvulwe ngendlela ehlelekile kancane kancane ngabe nje uwalala nomuthela wayeka ugwayi njengoba siyazi ukuthi eh isifo esiphatha kakhulu ugwayi nalesifo kuhlasela amaphaphu nezinye izitho zomzimba wona ke savaliwe e ikole siyazi ukuthi zizovulwa ungqongqoshe we ikole ushilo ukuthi zizovulwa kodwa nazo akuzovele kuvulwe nje ngela ngelodwa wonke umuntu kuzoya kancane kancane siyacela ke kakhulu njengoba kade nenzile nilalela ni usekela uhulumeni entweni obuzisho siyacela futhi kakhulu ukuthi niphinde nisekele kulezinga lesithathu sekufanele ngempela thina umuntu nomuntu athathe inyathelo zokuzivikela nezokuvikela abanye abantu njengoba kuvula imisebenzi siyazi ukuthi inamba kuzokwenzeka zikhuphuke kodwa umathina sithatha amandla siwafaka kuthina ukuthi mina ngeke ngiphume endlini ngayifakile imask 
mina ngizo gezizandla njalo mina ngizo kwenza ukuthi singasondelani ugcine yonke imithetho yempilo kuzosiza sonke siyanqela ke bantu bakithi ukuthi nje oba kade nenza nakade bengenzi baqale benze ngoba manje njengoba sekuvuliwe e ingozi njengoba umongamele eshili ukuthi njengoba kuvulwa ingozi inkulu yokuthi sibonini amanani esekhuphuka kakhulu esenza ukuthi ezempilo zethu zibe ingxaki esesifosa futhi mhlambu ukuthi sibuyele emuva kanti asithandi ubuyele emuva kodwa kufanele ukuthi wonke umuntu azi ukuthi kufanele abe nediscipline enze loko okufanele siyabonga Asbonge kakulu kungongoshe e, u minister Udla Minizuma. Niza tata leli tuwa manja ngekele ungongoshe e, Ibrahim Patel. Utinae azoti kapu kapu njengoba sesi vula ke manje izi mboni. Sega begi ilu ungongoshe Udla Minizuma utini ipi mini ningwane uza utina utina ilandele. Kutuwa nza ukela ke through the minister of trade and industry uh, to come before us and uh, indicate what are these areas that uh, industry as they open need to adhere to. Minister Ibrahim Pate. I would like to greet colleagues and members of the media and uh, fellow South Africans. My colleague, uh, Minister Lamini Zuma, has set out the broad details of the measures that apply in Level 3. This is the most significant reopening of the economy since the lockdown began uh, some 63 days ago, and it opens up all of our core productive sectors from manufacturing to uh, mining to all the productive services. It means that the country's steel mills and textile operations, the chemical plants, the plastic operations will all be able to operate at full capacity. The electronics and furniture and other sectors will all be able to produce both for the South African market and for export to the rest of the world. Uh, level 3 opens up uh, the rest of the finance sector like microfinance and many other parts of finance. And all of retail that up to now has not been opened, whether it is the sale of appliances or furniture or electronic goods, uh, all of the clothing industry, those are all open now through retail. There are a few limited exceptions which are, will be set out in the regulations and that my colleague has referred to and I will come back to. It also keeps open all parts of the economy that has operated under level four. So all of agriculture and food production, whether it is livestock or crops uh, for export as well as for our own people. It keeps open the healthcare sector, the production of medicines and personal protective equipment uh, all the hygiene supplies, cleaning materials, hand sanitizers, and so on. And of course, the production of electricity and water and data services. When the lockdown was first announced by President Ramaphosa, the intention was to restrict the movement uh, of all of us, uh, to keep as many of us at home, uh, except those who were undertaking the most essential services. And when the lockdown began on midnight of 27 March, there were only 927 confirmed cases of the coronavirus in South Africa. And that number has grown over the period. 
initially, before the lockdown, we had a doubling of the number of uh, infected uh, persons every two to three days. And the lockdown has begun to slow that down. The lockdown has come at a great sacrifice to our people, to businesses, to workers, to consumers, to all of us who value the ability to do the things that we do every day in our normal lives. But it has brought us valuable time, valuable time to put a number of measures into place. First, the slowing down of the virus, the spread of the virus, has avoided our healthcare system being overwhelmed uh, even before health officials and uh, uh, personnel in the sector has been able to prepare for the surge of patients. So in this period, uh, the time has been used to upgrade systems at hospitals, to build additional uh, field hospitals and expand the number of beds that are available, and very importantly, to train staff in managing in a COVID environment. Because we saw in the rest of the world, the, the most critical thing was hospitals were, uh, were, were crammed with patients, there were not enough beds, and hospital personnel were not ready. The second thing we've been able to do in the period up to level three is to build up the stocks of critical health care and uh, personal protective equipment. We've built up the stocks of surgical masks like the, the mask here and uh, uh, the not only masks that have been produced for medical personnel, but also face cloths, face, face masks that have been used uh, across uh, the public. We've built up uh, uh, hand sanitizer supplies, surgical gowns, and ventilators. Some of this we had to import from other parts of the world while we got our factories ready to get production going in South Africa, and we've ramped up production very significantly. Just um, uh, uh, tomorrow we'll be releasing more of the details. We'll show samples of all of this but some 38 million surgical masks have been acquired for the healthcare uh, workers and those admitted to hospitals. And local pro producers, companies based here in South Africa, uh, uh, with South African workers producing more and more of these masks. Finally, we've also been uh, able to uh, introduce more healthcare and sanitation protocols at workplaces. This period has been used to introduce it, to run pilots, to see what works, to expand it as more and more workers come back to work, the, the systems have been expanded. So most uh, workplaces today have some rudimentary sanitation and protocol arrangements in place. And we now look to scale those up under level three. Since the start of the lockdown, we've also built new structures of social solidarity between uh, citizens and residents of our country uh, and, and raise resources. Some of it has been some new technologies and ideas. Others have been money that's been put into the Solidarity Fund by, uh, by shoppers and people have put small amounts into, uh, into the bank accounts uh, as well as uh, businesses that have contributed uh, to the Solidarity Fund. So what we have now, uh, where we've got to now is how do we move from a strict lockdown to a, an arrangement that is more sustainable in the long term? When the virus first spread, we all recognized that the, the lockdown is a temporary measure. It's a blunt instrument. It's very effective because since we spread the virus as human beings when we move, when we keep ourselves at home, or largely at home, we limit the spread. So it's effective, but it also comes with enormous collateral damage. Uh, it hurts the economy. It causes significant and serious damage to the economy. So we developed in this lockdown period a set of sharper instruments or tools to deal with the spread. And it became known as the risk-adjusted approach uh, that had five levels. We moved from level five to level four. Looking at the health and other data, we now are ready, as my colleague has said, and as President Ramaphosa has said, to move to level three. During level four, we monitored 
what was happening at workplaces and in the public very carefully to see what could we learn. Where are we making some mistakes? Where can we improve the systems? Where are our protocols weak and they need to be uh, strengthened? If level five and to some extent level four uh, was based on detailed regulations uh, that were directed at having as many people at, ho at home as possible, Level three instead is based on most South Africans being at work. That's the big shift in level three. And the shift is therefore to a more flexible and collaborative uh, set of arrangements, including regulations that enable businesses to do more. And so the focus does shift to businesses and workers, to consumers taking careful measures to avoid or limit the spread of the virus. In moving to level three, we've consulted very, very widely. First, we published a framework that was put out for public uh, comment. More than 70,000 uh, comments were received uh, on the COCT uh, email addresses. And we had close to 1,000 uh, comments by business organizations and individual companies, trade unions and others uh, on the measures that we had publicized. After that, over the last few weeks, we've been working closely. The president convened meetings at NEDLAC, that's the uh, National Economic Development and Labor Council, where we brought in the social partners. We've met with provinces through the Presidential Coordinating Council, with many business organizations across the economy, with the largest trade union federations and many individual unions. We've met with individual sectors like the auto sector, the food sector, the retail ones, those who produce clothing and chemicals and steel and those doing the saw milling for the nation. We've also met with uh, players in e-commerce and those doing general goods. We've met with construction uh, companies, small ones as well as large ones. And all of these consultations were directed at getting ready to increase production, but at the same time to protect workers and customers from a rapid spread of the virus. And it looked also in this period, we looked at how can we avoid so much uh, pressure on the public transport system during the rush hour that people are crammed together and they become important and, and, and key sites for uh, the spread of the virus. And so this period has been about developing these protocols and getting everybody uh, on board. Under alert level three, many more economic activities will uh, be permitted with uh, something of the order of 8 million uh, additional workers that will be going to work, potentially more depending on how, com how many companies take up this. It means that almost our entire workforce will be back at work. Although we should um, uh, caution that the appeal has been made that those who can work from home should be uh, enabled and encouraged to work from home. Special care, of course, as my colleague has said, must be taken in the workplace for those who are over uh, 60 and those with comorbidities to uh, enable them to, to work from home where possible and uh, to, uh, to enable the workplace to be safer. In level five and level four, we had very detailed lists of the permitted activities. In level three, it's a big shift. It's a shift to setting out what is not allowed because the list now is much smaller. And the list is restricted to only those parts of economic activity where the risk of in, uh, infection is seen to be very high and which brings a lot of people into very close physical contact with each other, where the one and a half meter distance is difficult to maintain or where the regular cleaning of surfaces is difficult to do and where we need more time, more time to develop those protocols, to work with those sectors and see how can we safely open up more of those sectors. The list of restricted activities have been mentioned by Minister Dlamini Zuma. It includes, uh, for now, sit-down meals in restaurants, of course, all the delivery services like drive-through and uh, pickup services will be opened and you'd also be able to go to the takeaways and fetch your hot foods. If you go into a supermarket, you'd be able now to get the grilled chicken. But all of these will have uh, clear protocols to, to ensure that we don't have people all waiting at the same counter 
uh, and and these are risks of um, of transmission. On-site consumption of liquor is uh, not uh, uh, permitted, it's restricted. Uh, there are certain restrictions on uh, hotels and guest lodges and backpackers and so on for recreational purposes. In other words, people, tourists who come for recreation. For business purposes, it will be opened. If you need to travel for work purposes and you need to stay over at a hotel, that would be enabled. Uh, there would be limitations on passenger ships for recreational purposes and conference uh, uh, conferences and big events like your big uh, soccer and rugby sports events we have large numbers of uh, spectators uh, that spectator component that would not be uh, would not be open during level three but I do want to emphasize that we'll be engaging on a continuous basis with all of these sectors to see at what point would it be possible for more activities to open up? What would be the protocols? And what do we need to learn from the reopening of uh, the phase of the economy under level three? There's some uh, activities that will remain uh, restricted in the short term until we have better protocols in place uh, that we're working on. And they include things like um, uh, physical care services like hairdressers and so on. But we want to work with them immediately, not wait uh, very long to see what can be done to make those places safer. And uh, is there an opportunity? What can we learn from what the rest of the world is doing? And how can we ensure that uh, those places uh, uh, in due course can also open up? During level five and four, we had requested the Companies uh, and Intellectual Property Commission, it's known popularly, pro popularly as the CIPC, to use its biz portal uh, to offer a service to businesses who wanted to register their companies during the period of the lockdown. So those would be for companies that believe they were essential services or permitted services. This helped us quite a bit. It was proof that the senior management of the company had looked at the regulations and believed that they were covered by the regulations. It helped government to see how many workers were in the economy already doing work. And it gave us a good sense of the size of the essential service business, food, hygiene, and so on, that was opened. As we'll now, in level three, be having many, many more workplaces opening with many more uh, companies uh, covered by this, the registration portal will no longer be operated from Sunday midnight when, uh, uh, in fact, the regulations itself will, uh, will deal uh, with the relevant issues. On alcohol, uh, members of the media will know that the sale of alcohol has been a contentious issue with uh, some debate publicly on the matter. Government had concerns that we had communicated at the time about the impact of alcohol-related injuries and illnesses in clogging up our trauma units and healthcare systems. We had concerns about the, uh, the impact on transmission, particularly in public areas, when those who consume alcohol have a reduction in inhibitions. We were concerned about the challenge of maintaining the focus on staying at home when there were additional reasons why people traveled out of their homes. Uh, and uh, for all those reasons, alcohol was not um, permitted in level five and level four. Following uh, uh, careful consideration about what we sought to achieve with level three uh, and extensive consultation also with the, the industry, uh, we, we are uh, able to announce in the regulations the detail that the president had spoken of when he addressed the nation. We spoke, we met with supermarkets and bottle stores with uh, the people who produce the different types of alcohol uh, with taverns and um, and other places that sell alcohol uh, on their premises for consumption on their premises and many of the players recognized that government's concerns were real and that we needed to ensure that any reopening is managed very carefully of course some of them would have liked uh, a wider reopening, but in the course of the discussion, uh, I think we built a deep understanding uh, that this needs to be done carefully and it needs to be done in uh, phases. So in level three, 
it opens alcohol sale only for off-site consumption. And all sale of alcohol would be limited to Mondays to Thursdays from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. It will cover both those places with what are called on-consumption licenses. In other words, a license where you can consume alcohol on-premises, as well as those who have licenses only to sell for consumption off-premises. They're covered by the regulations. But all of them, all of those uh, types of businesses are required to ensure that alcohol is only consumed off-premises. So to be consumed essentially at home. The industry has agreed, this is the, uh, the liquor industry, that it will take a number of steps to address the risks of transmission at the shops, at the various places, and, uh, we, and it includes the delivery of personal protective equipment like masks and so on to taverns and other places. We'll issue a separate public statement containing the commitments that the industry has made. The uh, alcohol uh, producing industry has agreed to continue to produce some industrial alcohol for hand sanitizers and disinfectant purposes so that we don't run short of those uh, now that uh, consumption uh, or alcohol for human consumption has been reopened. As we open the workplace environment to greater uh, economic activity, the focus shift, as Minister Lamini Zuma has said, to what businesses need to do. In this period, it was about the regulations keeping as many people off the street and at their homes. Now more of the focus is what can be done in the workplace and uh, by shops and others. So we've used the last uh, few weeks to talk to industry. We've met with many of them, with trade unions and with business organizations, and uh, we've met with food and consumer companies, with uh, uh, the car producers and the people who make the car parts, the construction industry, uh, textiles and furniture and metal and electric cables, all of them. And in, in this, we've now developed some draft frameworks or compacts, which the regulations refer to. And these will be made public by the sectors in the next few days, in the run up to the 1st of June, when workplaces open. For example, in the framework um, agreements, uh, we cover things like uh, uh, personal protective equipment, social distancing, workplace hygiene, uh, how to ensure that every worker is screened every day when they come to work uh, and, uh, and when they leave. We've looked here at how to stagger working hours, uh, what can be done, what consultation would be necessary with, with unions uh, uh, to ensure that not everybody rushed to the taxi at the same time in the morning or to the train at the same time in the evening. Uh, the agreements are comprehensive. They create a framework for ensuring a safer uh, workplace in environment, but even when we have these measures in place, it will still take extraordinary focus and monitoring that we adhere to. We, we're looking now at examples, at as companies open, more cases are coming to light of people being COVID positive. We've seen, we've monitored the situation in retail stores that have been open for the last uh, six weeks or so, and we've seen a, a worrying number of people who are infected. So it's really a call for vigilance and for ensuring that we take every step to protect uh, the society, to protect the gains of the lockdown, which is that we've been able to, to limit the spread and to smooth it out. So it's called flattening the curve. It's really ensuring that we don't get a sudden spike in the numbers. Uh, I can point to the uh, food and consumer goods uh, sectors that have said they will make sure every worker has a basic supply of uh, personal protective equipment and they'll screen workers when they report to work. The automotive uh, uh, industry, for example, have said that they will uh, bring, uh, uh, make laptops and cell phones available to those who can work from home. And uh, when workers return, Everybody is taken through a training program uh, and, and we bed down the details uh, of that in the agreement. 
in the construction company they've agreed that workers will be trained on how to wear and remove uh, all the personal protective equipment they'll make facilities available for hand washing and where transport is provided they'll be working with the taxi industry and using their own facilities to reduce the numbers at any given point well let me let me conclude by saying that in the in the regulations as, uh, as set out by my colleague it really opens up most parts of the economy with a small limited number of sectors uh, or activities that are not yet open but we must must now begin to shift to rebuilding uh, the economy the impact of the pandemic has been severe on the economy it's been harsh it's been painful and it's been damaging both in south africa and across the world and as we open businesses again we must use all of our own efforts in government as consumers as workers to support local manufacturers uh, including small enterprises to promote the proudly south african campaign because when jobs are created here in local manufacturers they send an, a positive economic momentum right through the economy they create livelihoods uh, and they, they provide more resources in the society economists call this the multiplier effect and by what we buy by looking for the label by supporting the local producer by backing the small uh, uh, supplier uh, we can do so much more uh, and in a recent engagement we had with the big retailers they too agreed that as a retail sector they will promote the manufacture of local uh, products they'll support localization of supply and what they call import substitution as key planks to support economic revival and growth and uh, and they too recognize the importance of growing the small business sector and employment creation so as i conclude it's to say that we've we've used this time now also to put protocols in place and have a range of sector compacts in different industries that will enable more workers uh, to to benefit from uh, the the health uh, arrangements that have been put in place we've learned from some of the lessons of what has been done in the last number of weeks and we've refined the approach to be able to ensure that um, there's greater collaboration greater flexibility and greater working together in the period ahead trade unions will play a very important role shop stewards and workplace representatives in making sure that the message of being safe in the workplace is constantly reinforced and we look uh, to a period of deep partnership on the shop floor between managers and workers and with government backing and support uh, to keep our workplaces as safe as is possible thank you very much I'd like to thank your colleagues, uh, Minister Lamine Zuma, Minister Patel, and Minister Lamola. Um, we, we, we brought Minister Lamola here because uh, he's working quite close with the team that has crafted the regulations. So he says that he'll be ready to take questions. <coughs> uh, Minister, we have Mercedes Besant from SABC. That was quick. Okay, Mercedes percent. <laughs> no, I have not even opened for questions. <laughs> okay, Mercedes, let's hear you. Okay, I have two questions. One for Dr. Tlamini Zuma and uh, for Minister Patel. I just want some uh, clarity on the issue of uh, consumption, the sale of alcohol, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, not on site, but uh, for for uh, uh, for home consumption. I need clarity on the taverns. I heard him saying they are still in uh, talking to most of the liquor industry and so on. So you, the reason I'm asking this is that in areas where a bottle store is in town, that person might want to. If that person wants to buy a beer, uh, you know, the person will have to take a taxi, paying city rents just to go to town, and it means the person might have to buy, uh, pay uh, about. Uh, 50 rand just to get uh, a, a bottle of beer for 20 rand. So you, 
will licensed taverns be allowed, for example, to sell off con- uh, for off consumption? That is one question, because some of them might uh, start uh, end up uh, selling uh, illegally. Uh, uh, you also said, Minister Patel, I heard you, you said the workplaces are following all the sanitizing protocols. I just want to tell you that is not, uh, it's not, it's not, it's not true that everyone is following that. Even here in Mark's building, yesterday and today, some of the police who work at the checkpoint, they didn't even have sanitizers and they indicated even for the surfaces. So they do not have it. And I had to end up giving my uh, surface sanitizer. So the issue I want to point out of surface sanitizing is also very critical because we end up uh, getting problems when even at uh, retail shops, when you ask maybe the cashier or so on, even uh, just to sanitize the surfaces before they assist you. Uh, People, uh, sometimes they just get lazy. They don't want to do that. And uh, maybe one of the stressing points is that surfaces, it's not only your mask, it's not only social distancing, but when we're in the public places, surfaces when a customer says can you please sanitize before i put my goods it should be done so and maybe somebody shouldn't get angry and then the second one is to dr dlamini zuma the president that is the third one no 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 that 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 is the the third one okay okay no it's fine Uh, it's a comprehensive one dr dlamini zuma the president said exercising can be done throughout the day i would like to know when does the day end what time, according to the Corona Command Council, does the day end? And secondly, the president also said, you exercise as long as you don't do it in groups. But I have seen cyclists here in Cape Town cycling in groups without even wearing a mask under uh, level 4 lockdown. And even sometimes the police and the law enforcement, they see them, but nothing is being done. I saw about 10 of them on Sunday morning. So what should happen to those who break the regulations, such as cyclists, when other people who are not supposed to to, 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 to meet in groups are being told you are not, because then they will be harassed, you know, by the police. This is just about the fairness also in the application of the enforcement rules that I, that it's not to say, I'm saying you must not cycle in groups or whatever, but fairness when, when it comes to enforcing the Thank rules. you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you very much. We have another caller online. Yeah, hello. Uh, this is David McKenzie from CNN. I have a question for Minister Dlamini Zuma. Thanks for taking the time. We've uh, been reporting on the sale of illicit cigarettes and found large scale importation of banned cigarettes from Zimbabwe and other countries, and also cigarettes being sold at inflated prices on the street uh, considerably across South Africa. Why continue with the ban if cigarettes are still being smoked and no money is going to the state? Thank you. CNN. Next. <clears throat> Any other person? Okay, none ever from your, from your list. Um, yes, Minister. The first question is from Alex Mitchley from News24. And the question is directed to the Minister of Cocta. It reads as follows, Minister, you have made the record of the decision available as to why the ban on tobacco sales was extended on level four. But what scientific evidence was used to come up to the initial decision to lift the ban at level four? Likewise, what informed the decision initially to lift the ban at level three? Could you please give us detailed reasons behind these decisions? Can can we be clear, the ban on what? Basically, the question is, what informed the decision for the ban of cigarettes at level four and why it was lifted for level... What? Four. Okay, Okay, let me read the question again. Okay, yeah, just read the question, because I think we're all confused now. Yeah. What scientific evidence was used to come to the initial decision to lift the ban at level four? The initial decision. Okay. Likewise, what informed the initial decision to reinforce the, or to re, what is it? To lift the ban. Remember there was the lift of the ban, then it was re, then it was reinforced, and then it was banned again. So the question basically is what informed the decision to first lift it and to 
now not have it anymore. Well, I'm I'm not sure whether the 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 caller has read and has understood what the two ministers have said, because the ban on tobacco remains. Uh, so I'm I'm not sure what, but uh, well, they will assist me. Uh, ever since we started, we, we have not uh, unbanned tobacco, so that that's what might be confusing. We have not unbanned tobacco. Whether at level 5 and of level 4, we are now at level 3. We are continuing with the ban on tobacco. I'm just answering for the, for the colleagues, because we have not unbanned. I, I, think, I think it's referring to the initial announcement that the ban is lifted, which was then subsequently not lifted. Oh, De definitely we, we have not lifted the ban either on tobacco, either at level 5 or level 4 or level 3. But um, indeed all those are decisions of the NCC and C and cabinet. Um, and any other question? Yes. Uh, yes. Minister, we have um, another caller on the line. Yep. Caller. Hola, we, we are all ears. Good afternoon, Minister Mtembo. Yeah, Baba. Okay, I've got two questions. Who are you? Maria Sagani from Power 98.7. Oh, okay, thank you very much. You can now go ahead with your questions. The first question goes to both uh, Minister Nkosazana Jamini Zuma and Minister Lamola. Uh, particularly Minister Lamola, the special proclamation uh, declaration made by the SIU to the Portfolio Committee of Justice in Parliament, uh, our understanding is that obviously it was supposed to be escalated to the National Command Council to give the SIU special powers to investigate corruption-related matters on COVID-19, considering that the government has put aside 500 billion rands for relief, and we have seen acts of corruption. So I just want to find out whether the National just just a minute, has you, already... Uh, sorry, you have seen... You, you have seen a lot of corruption. There's been a lot of corruption being reported Th during thank you. COVID-19. Okay. During this COVID, during this COVID-19. Okay. Okay. Uh, processes. So the question is, the the, the 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 proclamation request to be considered for SIU to be given special powers, has it landed on the National Command Council, and how far is that process? Okay. And the second question. Uh, to to a, a, any minister with the schools reopening on Monday, the first of June, considering a the state of most of the schools in townships. Can, can, I, can, can I just assist you there? These ministers were talking to the regulations that will kick in for level three. There are ministers that will speak to their own areas of work. Uh, those ministers include the Minister of Basic Education and the Minister of Higher Education. That will happen tomorrow at 10 o'clock right here. Now, it will be up to you whether you want to continue, but I'm just trying to assist so that you don't ask these ministers who deal with regulations about schools when you have got the relevant ministers coming tomorrow at 10. Are we together? Oh. Uh, well, I think I've answered your question. C can we take the last question before we take the second round, Nangal? Um, Vikas Burger from Network Furindwendak is asking, will people be allowed on beaches for exercise and will they be allowed to surf and play non-contact sports such as golf for exercise? Um, he's also asking, has there been any decision or projection with regards to how long the whole of South Africa or certain parts with lower levels of infection will remain at level three before moving to level two? 
Okay. Colleagues, uh, I don't know who wants to start, Mam Kosazan. Oh, Kalemolamur. Agatha Kudum. You can use that mic, yes. I can speak from here. Okay. Yes. Thank you. I will uh, start with the issue of the proclamation that um, has been reported by the SIU to Parliament. It is indeed on our table for processing. But obviously, before you proclaim and um, ensure that that proclamation does go to the president, there are legalities that they uh, have needs to be fulfilled. And that is what we are currently dealing with, with the SIU, to finalize uh, the legalities, the extent of the, of the proclamation for what purpose and uh, for which specific uh, issues. Uh, because there should be some kind of prima facie issues that the SIU deals with, and it will then that will take it to to the to the president for his uh, consideration. The um, whether there is a projections with regard to the alert levels uh, for the other ones, we will attend to the other alert levels immediately after concluding this uh, uh, alert level three, and the nation will be duly informed when that process has been concluded. We, we are not in a position to state that the, it will be done in a week or two or, or so because it involves consultation, it involves uh, including internal consultation within government. Hence, sometimes the promulgation of the regulations will sometimes take time. You can't really give a specific answer that by tomorrow morning because of the level of consultation that is involved in the crafting of the of the regulations. And then... Um, <coughs> The, 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 maybe I could answer this one on, with regard to, 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 to training from what time to what time. In terms of the regulations, the, the day is, uh, is from 6 in the morning to 6 in the evening. And, um, and uh, it, is, uh, it is encouraged that people must not do so in groups. And the issue of, um, of, uh, of, of compliance by members of the public. You, you will realize that uh, from uh, this stage level 3, uh, the regulations place more responsibilities on the individuals themselves to take responsibility uh, and to ensure that um, their close uh, associates, family members also take responsibility and comply with the, with the health protocols that we all have to comply with for our own safety and for the safety of the whole nation. It is not the responsibility only of the police to ensure that we are compliant. As South Africans, we have that responsibility, and these regulations take that into account. The police comes in at a stage where there is clear non-compliance by members of the public, and uh, the first uh, intervention by the police uh, is, to, is to request you or to engage you to, to comply. That is what is expected, but then if people are not complying, then police will have to to enforce uh, 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 the, the law in terms of, of the Criminal Procedure Act. But what we want to emphasize is that people must take responsibility for their safety, uh, for their own health, uh, for themselves and for all of us. Thank you. Thank you very much. If we can assist uh, Minister Patel with that mic. Don't touch the mic yet. Yeah, touch that. <laughs> I did not touch the mic. Yes. Thank you. Well, uh, <coughs> thank you very much. Uh, there were two two questions or comments uh, directed to me, uh, both from uh, uh, Mercedes Present. The first is, where will alcohol be permitted to be sold? Will it only be at um, the large uh, supermarkets and bottle stores? Uh, and the answer is no. The regulations themselves will permit alcohol to be sold at any premise that carries a license, whether that license is for on consumption or off consumption. But the condition of the sale is that it can only be sold in sealed containers uh, for consumption at home. So no one can consume it on premises. So to make that a bit more practical, it would allow taverns and registered chibines and restaurants and so on to also sell alcohol, but subject to the condition 
it must be in a sealed uh, container and it must be consumed. Uh, the consumer has to take it away from that premises uh, in order to consume uh, it uh, at home. I should indicate that uh, we have stressed to the industry the continuing risks and they've undertaken to act responsibly and we will be uh, releasing more of that detail of the commitments the industry is making to ensure that the reopening of the sale of alcohol uh, would not be accompanied by all of the negative problems that we anticipated. In addition to that, we've also engaged with the nine provinces. Uh, liquor is regulated both by national government as well as by the provinces. And a number of provinces have their own legislation dealing with this. So we met uh, with the MECs uh, are responsible for liquor in the different provinces and they now will uh, talk to the liquor boards to uh, ensure that there's some coordination so that those who have a license uh, to sell alcohol for consumption on the premises only can now utilize that to sell it for consumption off the premises. I want to emphasize that no consumption would be permitted under level three for any alcohol that is consumed on premises. The second issue that came up from uh, Mercedes was on the adherence to the protocols and uh, particular attention was drawn to the surfaces uh, that needs to be public surfaces that needs to be constantly uh, disinfected. Uh, members of the media and South Africans watching here today would see every time we use the microphone then there is a, um, an official who comes and just quickly disinfects it. And that is done so that uh, if any of us are a COVID positive and we touch a surface, there is a possibility of leaving the virus there and the next person who touched that surface then picks up that virus, the minute they touch their own face there is a possibility of transmission of that virus. So that's one element of a range of measures. And um, uh, Mercedes correctly pointed out that there's not 100% adherence. As I noted in my remarks, we've seen a, an increasing number of workplaces reporting uh, big levels of infection. We saw it in the mining sector, we saw it in retail, some in, uh, in factories uh, and other places. That, that is, is an enormous risk that we must try to manage and keep the numbers as low as possible, try to use every reasonable means to avoid the spread uh, and the fast spread of um, the virus. So what are we doing about it? Well, there's two sets of things we're doing. The one is to get, make sure that what needs to be done at each workplace is clearer to everybody. So from government, we issue directions. The Minister of Employment and Labor has now issued a consolidated set of uh, directions that indicates in every workplace what is required, the distance that um, one must be from a worker, uh, the sanitation procedures that needs to be done. I issued a similar set of directions for all call centers, indicating that uh, they must uh, ensure that when workers clock in, uh, any of the biometrics don't require a physical touch, or if it does, that it's made COVID safe, and that uh, uh, the wearing of masks at workplaces would be required, that surfaces must be disinfected. In addition to our directions as government, we've also uh, sat down with, with industry, and a number of sectors have now agreed to, uh, uh, to guidelines or compacts, agreements, uh, that would set out what is expected of every company in that sector. We'll be releasing details of that over the next few days. Many of them have been concluded. More are in the process of being concluded. I read out a list earlier of sectors like textiles, the car making sector, retail that will be doing all of this. And then uh, as, as my colleague had indicated, every workplace must have a workplace plan indicating the measures, and that must be a written plan, so that at any point an inspector, a shop steward, anyone can come in and say, let's have a look at the workplace plan and how we can work, uh, work uh, together on that. But that's just, let's call it the intention. The practice depends on 
uh, monitoring and compliance, making sure that if a company says it will do this, that it actually does that. So we have asked industry associations to play a stronger role with uh, their, uh, their members. Of course, there are government inspectors from different departments that will also be able to go to workplaces to check that the safety of workers and of the public uh, are being looked after with uh, the, the necessary measures. But I have met with the leaders of all the major unions in the country uh, uh, over the last few days uh, to get their support, to get the tens of thousands of shop stewards at different workplaces working with the management, but also advising uh, government where there are instances where in a particular workplace there is no adherence to the, uh, to the measures. Uh, and in addition to that, uh, every workplace must have a COVID compliance officer. It's not just left vaguely. When an inspector comes in and says, who is the officer? That person has to come forward. When the inspector uh, or the um, a worker in himself or herself working there says, but hang on, where is the sanitizer uh, that uh, the, the directions talk about? Then there is a named person, somebody known to everybody in the company that's responsible to ensure that. We sat with industry to say, retrain all of your health and safety officers to bargaining councils, retrain your inspectors so that we have large numbers of people who can just reinforce this message at every level. And ultimately, the most important guarantee of the system is that South Africans, citizens, residents, consumers, workers insist that there has to be a reasonable measures consistent with what government has published, that this is a system of greater collaboration. It's not going to be all down to regulations. We, we needed to rely on regulations in the early phases, level five and level four, but we have to shift now to much more agreements, much more implementation of guidelines, and much more working together at the workplace. So when we see examples as the one that uh, Mercedes have pointed to, please raise it with the management, ask to speak to the, the COVID compliance officer, point out the problem, and we are building a system. It's not going to be perfect. And every time there's cracks in the system, that's where the virus comes through and infects, uh, infects human beings and, um, and leads to the, the, the challenges and, and the fatalities that we've seen in the country and elsewhere in the world. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Minister. Minister Tlaminezo. Yeah, you can use that one. Yeah, it's fine. Uh, hello. Okay. Uh, thank you very much for the questions. I think most of them have been answered by my colleagues. Maybe I'll just add to one of the questions about whether there is pro this projection of when we are going to level two. I think we just going to enter level three on the 1st of June and depending on how the pandemic goes, how the virus goes, um, we, we can't tell right now, as my colleagues have said, when we will be able to go to level two. But as we are entering the differentiated um, risk so it may be that there may be places that may go to level two before others. But for now, we're all going to level three with the wet hot spots where uh, more stringent measures may, uh, be, um, may, may be announced. Uh, so uh, that one, and I think the minister also did uh, talk about exercise. We must do what the president said, not in groups, six to six, social distancing, masks. And in fact, it's those things where people do not keep to the health protocols that fuel the spread of the virus. So it's important that we do so. And the, about the cigarettes, 
I think it's important that where there is crime, crime is attended to. If you see crime, report it to the police, that the law takes its course. So if people are doing anything criminal about cigarettes, the law must take its course. The rest, I will not say much because this matter is in court as we speak. The, we, we were taken to court about cigarettes. So uh, there, there is plenty of scientific evidence and it will all be aired in court as the matter is in court as we speak. Um, I think the schools, the matter has been uh, clarified that ministers are going to come and talk about their different departments and sectors. Uh, there is somebody who asked me also about higher education. The same is the answer that the higher education uh, will be, uh, the Minister of Higher Education will clarify what the plan is and answer all the questions. Uh, there is somebody who sent me an SMS about opening the churches and I think I think it's important that no nobody is forced to go to church because the, the, the person here says we are sending people to the slaughterhouse by opening the churches. So nobody is forced to go to church. The government has just opened an option and there are very strict and stringent measures that have to be followed um, when people go to church. Not just the numbers but what must happen and it will be published, these measures will be published. But as we said, also, people who are over 60 are encouraged not to go to church, just as they are encouraged to work at home if they can. But there is no one who, government is not forcing people to go to church. It's an option that is being opened. And if people feel they are not, they don't feel safe to go to church, they shouldn't. That would be my answer to the SMS here. I think those are those were the questions. Um, yeah. Thank you very much. We will now take the second round of questions. Uh, look at, do we have anything online? And, and maybe let me just say on the sports issues, the Minister of Sports yeah. will also come and he will clarify all the questions about sports. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, any any online? Okay. Uh, Nangla? We have a question from Fadima from ITV Networks. And her question is, uh, Minister, shopping aisles are very close to each other in, in supermarkets. People come close to each other while passing and choosing groceries. Even packers are busy while people are passing from both directions which puts them in a difficult situation, which makes social distancing quite difficult in these situations. How can this be addressed? The next question is from Miriam Issa from Finweek, and it goes as follows. Um, in his address announcing permission for religious gatherings for up to 50 people, the president said that the gov that government wanted to take care of the spiritual, psychological and emotional well-being of South Africans. This being the case, why are people who do not attend places of worship still prohibited from visiting their friends and loved ones? Is this concern for the psychological well-being which the president spoke to limited only to people who attend religious gatherings where the infection rate is high, even uh, with protective measures? Um, the next question is from Wong Asihai from Inkonjana FM. And he's asking, there have been suggestions for people who are 60 years and above 
uh, to work from home, has the NCC looked at situations um, wherein there are teachers who are above the age of 60 who would have to go back to school since schools are opening? Um, he's also asking, does the opening of churches also mean that traditional gatherings are allowed since some people use traditional gatherings for spiritual guidance? Can I continue? No, well, I mean, how many do we have? Can you give us the last one? Okay. You seem to be having a packet full there. Yes, indeed, Minister. Um, there's a question from Anton from Pretoria News. He's asking, uh, Cyril, pre sorry, President Cyril Ramaphosa said in his announcement on Sunday that collection of food will be allowed, but there's no mention of the collection of food in the regulations. Does this mean that it is no longer allowed? And his last question is, are domestic workers allowed to go back to work? Thank you. Okay. Can we clarify collection of food? Yes. Or dissemination of food? Uh, collection of food from restaurants. Oh. Yes. <laughs> okay. I thought that maybe they mean the dissemination of food parcels. Uh, colleagues, who, who wants to start? Maybe the, the one of the schools can we allow the relevant ministers to respond to that tomorrow? It's not uh, too far from now. It's tomorrow morning. Maybe let me just alert South Africa that from here, after these ministers are done, at uh, 5 o'clock, we will have the ministers that are dealing with the JCPS, uh, police, defense, home affairs, justice uh, coming to also put their their preparedness for level three then tomorrow morning at 10 we'll have the social cluster the social cluster includes ministers of higher education minister of ministers of basic education uh, ministers of uh, social development minister of health and others so we will have uh, of course, Minister of Arts, Culture and Sports, they will all be here. And then in the afternoon tomorrow, we'll have the economic cluster uh, with uh, Ministers of Employment and Labor, Ministers of uh, Mining and Minerals and Energy, uh, Ministers of uh, Land and Agriculture, Minister of Trade and Industry. I don't know whether he'll come back again because he's here. Uh, <laughs> so we have all these uh, uh, ministers coming to speak to us as South Africans on what is the preparedness of the various clusters for Level 3. Uh, that answers the school's question. Colleagues, uh, Minister uh, Damula. Answer the one of gatherings that um, uh, all, all, all gatherings are are prohibited except the gatherings that we have uh, specifically allowed in terms of the regulations for faith based institutions uh, as the minister has already said a funeral a gathering at the workplace for workplace purposes an agricultural auction subject to the direction issued by the cabinet member responsible for for agriculture so the, that those are the only forms of, of of gatherings including the the one that uh, we have just mentioned of a professional non-contact sports which may only include players match officials journalists and medical and television crew as per directions issued by the cabinet member responsible for sports and i think he will further elaborate uh, on that. So these are the only gatherings uh, allowed at this stage. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Minister Patel, any? Thank you very much. The question that was uh, posed about uh, shopping hours and the impact on density of shopping, uh, we're constantly looking at how to uh, ensure that we have the shopping environment as safe as possible and uh, as level three uh, now opens up many more stores will open this may have the effect in part of um, distributing people more 
evenly during a trip to the shopping mall. But there are risks as more goods are sold, even in the traditional grocers, that we'd have more foot traffic, which is why in the earlier phases there were a more limited uh, number of goods. But as the goods increase, uh, there's no question that there will be more pressure. It's an area we've got a, a forum a, where we engage with the CEOs of retailers. So we'll be keeping an eye on this. And uh, as and when adjustments are needed, we would need to make this. This is the, the essence of the collaborative approach. It's that we're in this together. It's not government want to restrict uh, someone. It's that we need to work together to limit the spread of, of the virus. On the question where the domestic workers are able to return to work, the answer is yes, they are able to return to work, subject, of course, to the health uh, protocols being followed. There are particular challenges sometimes in a domestic environment, and uh, we will be looking to see whether the existing directions may need to be elaborated or expanded to provide for circumstances like that. But even as uh, domestic workers return, it's absolutely vital that it be done in those circumstances where it can be done so safely. On collection of food from restaurants, where you place an order with the restaurant and you go and pick up your, uh, your food, that is permitted under level three. Uh, we encourage everybody to uh, uh, do the ordering by phone or online so that there isn't a need to wait uh, at the restaurant because it's those moments when people congregate uh, and one person sneezes or coughs uh, or someone touches a surface that someone else then touch uh, that there are greater risk. If we can keep people moving uh, quickly, if um, the store owners can disinfect the surfaces, uh, if some uh, drive-through arrangements are used and curbside delivery arrangements are used, all of those can help to reduce the risk. We can't eliminate risk completely. Uh, the virus will spread. It's how to avoid it spreading so fast that it overwhelms the healthcare system. And that's uh, what we're seeking to do. And for that reason, a lot of our discussion over the last number of weeks has been to explain the rationale or the logic of the risk-adjusted approach to more and more constituents, to take everyone into our confidence and say, it's not really about finding a loophole in the regulations. It's working with us to get the intent and purpose of the regulations embedded in the practices in a workplace. And that's what, we, what we're seeking to do more and more. We look at the impact that uh, the spread of the virus can have in a particular workplace, but we also look at the impact that it can have when uh, uh, many workplaces are opened at the same time. There are some sectors where more work needs to be done with that sector. There are some sectors where we need to just learn from level three and see what are the learnings that can be taken to the additional activities. But most economic activities have opened now. The value of the phased opening, the step by step, is we can learn as we make some mistakes, as we have lapses, as uh, uh, one of the journalists pointed out earlier, where a particular a building in Cape Town was not sanitizing uh, uh, the surfaces uh, properly. Uh, as we learn those things, we can incorporate it uh, as we open up. So that's the, the essence of the risk-adjusted approach. Level three is about taking that risk-adjusted approach and saying greater responsibility on uh, workplaces, on businesses, greater role and responsibility that uh, health and safety officers COVID officers uh, and COVID compliance officers. And, and of course, importantly, shop stewards can play in helping to make the working environment uh, a safe one. Just as in normal times, uh, many trade unions focus on improving the uh, standards of living of workers. In this period, a lot of the, the work and the collaboration and partnership must be about saving lives because uh, we've balanced the importance of saving lives, and we've also focused on securing and protecting livelihoods. Thank you. So thank you, Minister Patel. Minister Lamanism. Mm. Kingdom. <coughs> 
Hello. I think all the questions have been answered. Okay. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. <coughs> if if we still, sorry, my apologies. If there are still questions, I see that you had a a load truck full. Uh, no, never. Yeah. Oh, do we have somebody online? Yes, Minister, we have two callers. The first is Alex Mitchley from News 24 and William Hogg of ENCA. Alex? Uh, good afternoon, Minister. I just want to clarify my question. Okay. Essentially, before the U-turn was made on the ban on cigarettes, the President announced that they would be lifting the ban on cigarettes. I'd like to know what science and evidence was used when the president announced that lift, despite the fact that there was a U-turn. And then the same goes for, it was still put into level three that cigarettes would be allowed. This was obviously changed again. So I want to know what science and decisions was that based on, despite the fact that you guys eventually decided to continue the ban. That's my first question. My second question is, were there experts or scientists consulted on the ban of tobacco products? From, from the court papers, it appears that only studies were used that affirms government's position. Did you weight these studies against other studies that came to different findings? A good example could even be the UCT study that found 90% of people were still smoking. <coughs> Just be, be, before you continue. You, you are saying you are aware that this matter is before court, isn't it? Yeah, sure, but this information would not be subjudicated. Who says that? Is it you? Well, to my understanding, at least. Definitely. Any matter that is before court can't be discussed in a public, because we are preparing ourselves to defend ourselves in a court of law. Can we allow the court process to continue without being disturbed by ourselves? Um, All right. Thank All you very right. much. So we, we are not going to answer to that question because from right. our understanding, it is subjudicate. All right. Thank you, Minister. In that case, the data around obesity and COVID-19 mortality is, appears to be a lot stronger than smoking. Therefore, fast food and fizzy drinks will obviously be uh, pretty dangerous. So why wasn't a ban considered on these to protect against the same possible outcomes as cited for the ban on cigarettes? That's all. Thank you, Minister. Yeah, Gunzima, serious. Um, <laughs> next, um, Vuyo. Uh, yes, um, Vuyo Mbogo, ENC. Uh, I had the minister saying, um, uh, pointing uh, to the obvious fact that uh, no one is forced um, to go to church. But of course, I mean, we have a history here of uh, people who are desperate to be healed of their sicknesses or who want to be comforted, getting exploited, uh, I mean, expo uh, exploited by uh, some of uh, the religious uh, leaders we've seen lately. And on top of that, it is a fact, it's been uh, proved that mass gatherings have, a, have made a big contribution in the rising numbers of people infected uh, by the virus, as we have seen in places like the Eastern Cape uh, uh, on the back of a funeral there. Which then brings me to the question, what actually persuaded the NCC to change its decision on religious um, gatherings? And why uh, was the announcement not made by the president on Sunday uh, and was rather made like a couple of days um, later? By the way, let, let me answer the question for you. First of all, you will know that the president has been meeting with various sectors, and the ministers have said so. Various sectors and various groupings, including the faith uh, groupings in our country. Uh, and indeed, the president did indicate in his address to the nation that he is continuing these meetings with our faith-based organizations. It was after he had concluded these meetings that the president then came to the NCC. When did we have the NCC? On Tuesday. Uh, on Tuesday, where indeed the NCC then took the decision 
based on the consultation that had been made, that uh, we should, uh, on the strength of the evidence that uh, and the discussions that had occurred between the president and faith-based organizations, that the churches, synagogues, and mosques should be opened. That is the decision of the National uh, Coronavirus Command Council. Of course, also a decision of our cabinet, uh, and uh, informed by the discussions that have been held between ourselves and the faith-based organizations. That's why then the president later on, on Tuesday, then spoke on this matter. Uh, I hope that you, you, you are aware of these timelines, Vuyo. That, yes, yes. yes, but can't you enlighten us on the arguments as Minister Zamini Zuma did with cigarettes, for example? On the arguments. As the sense that we understand what the issues were, because uh, and I'm not coming from any particular, uh, particular sort of ideological premise. I'm just trying to understand that in the management of the pandemic, where it has been proven that an assembly of groups of people contributes to the rise in the numbers of cases. So what was the, what persuaded the president or whoever took the decision finally that this was the way to go? It will help the nation, I think, if we understand. First the of logic. all, we, we, we have agreed funerals to be packed at 50 people. And as you will also know, funerals normally start in these houses of worship. Let's first start there. So you have got 50 people who attend a funeral who starts at the house of worship and thereafter, thereafter proceeds to a place where the person will be laid to rest. The argument by churches was that if you have allowed 50 already, does it make any sense or is it rational for you to disallow churches if they maintain the 50? If they maintain the 50, the same number that we have allowed for funerals, the same number that comes to churches uh, at, for funeral purposes, why would you not allow the same number? Now, where you are not correct, we are, we are saying even the churches, this is what the ministers have said, will have to adhere to the health and hygiene measures that we have pronounced, including social distancing. So again, key to this uh, hygiene measures is that you cannot have more than 50 people in any worship house. So normally our churches, <laughs> I don't know whether you know how many people go to our churches. Normally, we have loads and loads of people coming to our churches. That has now been curtailed to the number 50. But also, that number must also ensure that there is social distancing. The Minister of Culture said, if with social distancing the church can't take 50, the church will be then forced to take lesser numbers. Uh, of course, also the church must adhere to the other prescripts, health prescripts, including mask, wearing of mask, including the washing of hands, etc., etc. We think that as the NCC and cabinet, we have taken the necessary precautions uh, that churches and protocols that churches must adhere. By the way, those protocols are also in our regulations. Those protocols are in the regulations that we are gathered. They are in the directions uh, that we are putting forward how churches uh, sh should uh, arrange themselves, what are the numbers and uh, what are the measures that they should adhere to. So we have taken all the precautions. Let me go again to one question that has been raised. Somebody said that the, the church activity in the free state contributed to the spread of the disease, yes, but there were no measures there. There was no number 50. There were no, there were no masks that uh, were prescribed at that time. Also, there was no social distancing. 
there was no washing of hands at that at that time equally even the difficulty that we had in the eastern cape that difficulty arose because these measures had not been put in place can we allow the churches to practice these measures and open and uh, again the churches by the way have said to all of us as government that they will adhere to the spirit and every detail of these measures that were putting in place this is what informed the decision of cabinet this is what informed the decision of of the national coronavirus uh, command council to open for the churches because they are ready to implement all these measures that we have put in place to combat the spread of coronavirus. Similarly, by the way, if you make these uh, uh, measures uh, applicable to industry, indeed we have opened the industry. Uh, the Minister of uh, Trade and Industry has just said over 8 million people on the 1st of of June on Monday will be going to work. Various sectors of the economy will be open. Uh, on, on what basis then do you say a church that says we will also observe these measures that will be observed by all these other categories that will be open? On what basis do you then say they cannot open? It became very difficult. So we are leveling up with you, Vuyo, but also leveling up with the people of South Africa. That all our churches, all our mosques, uh, all our synagogues will adhere to all the measures we have put in place. They will adhere to uh, social distancing. They will adhere to the prescripts around health, including washing of hands. They will adhere similarly to wearing of masks uh, in the churches because this is the law now. So all of us will adhere to this law and all church leaders in their meeting with the president and members of the executive have said, President, we are ready to adhere to all these measures. On what basis would we then have said, no, you can't, you can't open? I don't know whether you want to add anything, colleagues, or have I covered you? <laughs> no, I, I, we are covered. Very well. <laughs> very well. <laughs> Thank you very much. I, I hope that, that that explains. In fact, by the way, the Minister of Trade and Industry has also said there are some sectors that we have not uh, opened for now. But these sectors, if they come to us and say, by the way, will not be sectors that uh, basically allow the spread of the disease. These are measures that we have put in place. In fact, there are discussions that are ongoing as we speak now between some ministers and some sectors. So our, our preoccupation as cabinet and as the NCCC is whether there are measures in place to combat the spread of the disease in any sector, not only in the churches, but in any sector, including the sectors that will be opening on the 1st of June 2020, this coming Monday. I hope I've answered your question elaborately for you. Was there any other question? Yes. Yeah. Um, just a reminder on the question on domestic workers, whether they are allowed to, to go back to work. Oh. Okay. Yeah, who wants to answer it? Okay, Minister Atlanta. But maybe we can... Yes, they are allowed to go back to work. Yeah, they, 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 they are part of the working sector. All workers are allowed to go back to work on condition that they adhere to the measures that we have just spoken to, including domestic workers. And, and also, some of them are actually a support structure for those who are going back to work, True, yes. especially also essential workers and others. Thank you. Uh, Nana? 
Uh, Charlotte from EWN is asking what kind of notice will be given to hotspot areas before their lockdown status is changed? Will it be a matter of days or hours? And she's also asking how much thought was given to the knock-on effects of allowing of allowing alcohol to be sold again, especially given the extra burden this will place on trauma units and the health system at large. Then there's a question from Joe from CCTV Joburg. Uh, families have been separated for, from older parents and working children who live in different towns and provinces now for about 63 days. Uh, what is available for families within provinces to see each other and will families be allowed to see each other interprovincially as well? Then Rose from News SA is asking will weddings be allowed under level 3? Um, and just an added question to that is to just clarify whether those people who will be going back to work under level three will need a permit uh, to, to go back to work. Uh, James De Villiers from News 24 is asking, will professional sports matches be allowed and what will the conditions uh, can, be? Can we, can we hold on that question? The Minister of Arts, Culture and Sport will be here to explain the circumstances around sporting and arts. Okay. I, th I think it's tomorrow. Is it tomorrow? On Saturday. On Saturday, yes. yes yeah. uh, Lamise from Fin24 is asking, may the ministers please provide clarity on why hairdressers and beauty services may not operate under level three. These are industries which are arguably highly sanitary. And uh, there's is, also... Is that not the fifth one? <laughs> can, can you count... <laughs> Thank you very much. I think it was the fifth one. Okay. Who wants to start, colleagues? Uh, oh. Oh, Lamola. Lamola, you want to start? No. Okay. <laughs> this time, yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. okay. Uh, sis. Uh, thank you. Weddings. Um for level three are not allowed yet but people can get married it's just the wedding celebration as far as i know you can go and get married get a certificate but it's the it's the actual wedding celebration that the party is, the party yes that is not yet allowed and then the, I think the, 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 the minister Ntembu has said that there are discussions with saloons and with other industries to look at how there, because there there is no social distancing. So we're looking at what are the measures that need to be taken to mitigate the fact that if you are cutting somebody else's hair or you are doing somebody else's face or nails, you can't be one and a half meters away from them. So it's, the discussion is going on to see how that can be mitigated. And the, once that is resolved, the matter will then uh, be concluded and they'll probably be opened. So discussions are ongoing. There may be what we may call enhanced level three, where if those matters are concluded, m more uh, regulations can be put in place to enhance the ones that we have. Um, that's the question on hairdressers, that's the question on weddings. Um, so, so for now, I'll, I'll answer those. Thanks. Yeah, uh, Minister Patel, can answer the others. Thank you very much. On the uh, question that was asked about uh, permits under Level Three, uh, what's required for those going to work is simply something uh, a letter that's issued by the employer in the regulations, the form of the letter is set out. I think we recognize that as more and more people go to, to work, 
uh, it becomes uh, important to shift the focus on other measures, uh, such as maintaining a safe workplace, uh, ensuring that we take the pressures off the public uh, transport system. Uh, but we should, within the limit still, we're strongly encouraging everybody to limit the amount of movement. And as the President indicated on Sunday, uh, leaving the House is really for the, the reasons specified. Uh, and, and that is set out in the regulations. And the President had uh, given an indication of that on Sunday. So <clears throat> we are looking here for simplified ways of doing things. Uh, but uh, that uh, letter that the employers um, uh, give out to workers uh, would still be in the regulations. On the question of um, uh, uh, travel, I think uh, all of the travel-related questions had been uh, addressed earlier, but if there's any specific question uh, that we haven't covered, it can be brought to our attention. Uh, on travel between provinces, I think the regulations set out the circumstances there. Uh, of course, as more of the economy opens up, we will see a significant increase in travel between provinces. Our key concern is to ensure that when we have a hotspot, that um, the infection rates out of that hotspot don't affect the surrounding places and other parts. So a measure of caution is still necessary uh, until we're able to dampen down all of the key hotspots. In some of the larger hotspots in Cape Town, for example, the rate of infection is significantly higher uh, than the rest of the country. And if that level of infection had to be obtained everywhere in the country, it would place our healthcare system under such severe strain. There won't be enough hospital beds everywhere in the country to manage that. On the, um, the notice in respect of hotspots, I think those are issues that we, we're looking at. What is the rate of infection? Is it increasing or is it beginning to stabilize? Are the other measures that government is putting in, in place, uh, sending medical teams, um, uh, epidemiologists and uh, 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 practitioners and uh, 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 healthcare workers who can do screening in an area, working more closely with uh, local authorities in the area, uh, ensuring that um, special measures are taken in respect of uh, shops that are open in the area. All of that is intended to have uh, an effect. If those don't work, then we just have to use more tools in the toolbox. It gets escalated. How much notice will be given? But it depends really on how serious the challenge is. If we suddenly face with a massive uh, spike and it's growing at an enormously fast rate, then there will be very little notice. If we're seeing an increase, it is worrying, uh, but it's increasing at a steady and predictable rate, there's more chance for other interventions and for notice. So this is like any fast moving thing. We've got to keep a degree of flexibility in the approach uh, that we take. On the knock on effect of the sale of alcohol, I think uh, the caller uh, from, uh, I think it was from EWN, uh, summed up very well the concerns that government had, which meant at level five and level four, it was imperative while we tried to buy space for the healthcare system to ensure that we don't have the additional burden of uh, trauma patients as a result of alcohol-related uh, car accidents and um, uh, uh, physical fights and, uh, and uh, uh, shootings and so on. Those problems don't disappear under Level uh, 3. It's not as if uh, the potential dangers are not there. And for that reason, uh, we've taken the view and we've communicated intensely with the industry that it can't be an immediate and blanket reopening of the sale of alcohol in the same way as it was before. There are uh, defined days, there are defined hours, uh, there are special measures that will be set out either in the regulation or in the directions that we issue. And in addition to that, the industry itself uh, will be held to the commitment that they've made to government, that they will take strong and active steps to try to, to 
dissuade and discourage binge drinking and the kind of abuse of alcohol that has seen our trauma units absolutely filled with patients uh, that are in some other way related to, uh, to alcohol-induced uh, 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 challenges. So instead of a fight over does it or does it not, we've, I hope and I, I think we've shifted the discussion uh, with the alcohol industry to say, recognize that these problems are real. Now work to see how we can reduce the level of that problem. Uh, of course, we will have to see as the uh, coronavirus uh, levels rise in future, and they will rise, uh, what impact that will have on our healthcare system and what adjustments, if any, we will have to make uh, to, to secure the space in hospitals to save lives. And that's why the more responsibly uh, we can get the industry to act uh, and the, 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 the lower the burden on the public and private healthcare system for that matter, uh, the, the greater the prospects that this collaborative approach uh, can, can be sustained. Uh, but uh, you, 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 you raise, I think, the fundamental dilemma for public policy. For every action that we take, there's an argument for and there's an argument against. And, and really, in level five and level four, we were very, very cautious as government. In level three and level two, the, it, it relies to a much greater extent on collaboration and working together. It requires more flexibility in the regulations to enable that, but it still means that this, the outcome that we want is exactly the same, saving lives, uh, reducing the spread of infection, pushing out the peak as far as we can, uh, putting more effort, money and resources into building up the hospital capabilities and the systems in hospitals. The president mentioned a major automaker VW that is building a, uh, a hospital in um, uh, on premises owned by the company where 4,000 beds will be available. We also have another automaker in the Eastern Cape, Isuzu, that has made their team of engineers and, uh, uh, and, and workplace specialists available to go to the local public hospitals and refurbish it, clean it up, improve the flow so that um, uh, patients could go through more easily and um, expand uh, the isolation facilities uh, that are available. We will be, the president has made an appeal to, to businesses when he met with business leaders uh, before the announcement of level three. And he said to them, we are contemplating a move to level three, but we will need your support. We will need your support in expanding healthcare facilities and importantly also in helping us to secure additional quarantine facilities for workers who are affected by COVID-19. So you will see in the, in the weeks ahead, a greater focus to those collaborative measures that are necessary uh, and that we think can can expand hopefully uh, the the capacity we can draw on as the number of cases rise at the same time we need to do everything possible to also reduce the spread of the infection so it's a combination do things that will lower the spread and at the same time build more capacity to manage a greater number of South Africans who will be COVID positive. I think, uh, colleague, those were the additional questions that uh, I could answer. Thank you. Uh, Minister Lamar, you are good. Good luck, pass, Lord, dear Coxarenga. Ten. Hallelujah. <laughs> uh, can, can we take five? Okay. Um. Sorry. The which is the last five? The the last five. Okay, I'll take the last five, Minister. Um, John John Fraser from ZA Confidential is asking Minister Patel had referred to directions for call centers and is asking whether those have been made public yet then there's a question from 
um, Jan Delanga from Rapport, it's also directed to Minister Patel, and is asking, uh, is the minister considering price controls on basic foods like bread and, fe and fresh produce in areas where small local producers have been disconnected from their markets and the five and the five big suppliers has increased prices due to increased demand for these basic foods and is also asking whether uh, any special arrangements have been agreed upon with the liquor industry to prevent the initial rush um, that that is expected on monday morning when when the the sale of alcohol will be allowed again uh, mike cohen from bloomberg is asking why do parks and benches remain closed that parks and beaches remain closed does the this does not cause crowding in any other places where people exercise basically asking why are we not opening uh, beaches and parks uh peter detroit from news 24 is asking the is asking minister mtembo to clarify he says uh, minister mtembo says evidence was considered in meetings between the president and religious leaders before the decision was taken to reopen places of worship what does this ev evidence entail what does what is the evidence based on and given given that churches in korea and in bloomfontein were considered super spreaders of infections <laughs> um we the next question what which is the last one um from Evelyn from Caxton Durban and it's directed to Minister Patel with the reopening of microfinancing enterprises what controls is being implemented to prevent people from becoming seriously over indebted out of desperation due to hardships like job losses resulting from the pandemic uh, does the minister have any idea if this is going to increase the repo and landing rate and she's also asking what is what is the stage going to what is the stage going to use to replace the state i'm yeah i think she wanted to say the state what is the state going to use to replace the taxation income loss resulting from the ban on products usually that usually attract syntax thank you sin or syntax syntax oh syntax or test syntax so, Minister, <laughs> okay. so Minister, we have one caller from Finwick. Finwick? Um, it's Maria Isa. Okay. Oh, the, that caller is coming back again. Caller, Mrs. <laughs> we are listening. Well, we, we don't have the caller. Let, let, let me answer the question again directed to me why what is the reasoning for opening churches when they were seen to be the spreaders in the eastern cape and the free state now we have answered the question we said in the eastern cape at st john's when that uh, spreading happened it was because amongst others we we they did not have the protocols that we have now. Similarly, even in the free state, there was no social distancing. The churches could accommodate millions or thousands of people at the same time. We are now saying churches can only accommodate 50 people. Even with the 50 people that can be accommodated maximum uh, worshippers, there must be social distancing, even amongst the 50. And if the social distancing makes the place uh, not workable for 50 people, then indeed the churches might as well go to 40, 30, but they can't be more than 50. So these are rules and laws that we have put in place to ensure that there is no spreading as it happened. Uh, earlier on in, in the churches. Secondly, we, we are saying indeed even the churches must adhere to the hygiene and health protocols uh, of sanitizing as people come in uh, and ensure that uh, indeed we, we, we are not having the problems uh, of touching and hugging. Uh, this will not only apply to churches but to all 
of us. Uh, we are no longer touching, we are no longer hugging. Uh, so this protocol will also apply to churches. Uh, we, we believe with all these measures that uh, we are putting in place, the opening of churches does not pose the risk that they would have posed had we not put in place these measures. Uh, therefore, we are quite convinced that we have done everything in our power. Of course, working with the, with the faith sector, we, you know, we, we are a government that is consultative by its very nature. We have consulted with the churches. They have agreed, by the way, to all these measures. That you won't have a synagogue, you won't have a mosque or a church that will have more than 50 people at any given point in time. But even those 50 people or worshippers will be subjected to social distancing and all the other measures that we have spoken to. Uh, so we, we, we believe all these measures really mitigate against the, uh, the contracting of coronavirus in our churches, in our synagogues, and in our mocks, in our mocks. So I, I hope I've again answered the question. Uh, who wants to come in now? Patel, yeah, Patel, you seem to be most loved this evening, this afternoon. They love you to bits. <laughs> Okay, no, thank you very much. Uh, with uh, so much love uh, <clears throat> from the media, uh, how can I go wrong? Um, first, let me start with uh, the question asked by John Fraser, which is the call center directions. Has it been made public yet? The answer, John, is that uh, I issued it on the 9th of April, uh, and it was published in uh, the Government Gazette. It was then used as the basis to reopen call centers and it provided uh, a set of directions and measures that every call center needs to have in place. And I gave some examples of it earlier uh, and those included things like that there must be a one and a half meter gap between workers when they are working, that no workers would share the same utensils in the canteen or the same equipment on the, um, in the workplace. Uh, it included uh, measures to uh, require the company to think carefully about clocking in arrangements in the morning because these call centers employ large numbers of people. In fact, South Africa has become a major location for call centers, not just for businesses locally, but in fact for global companies who see South African workers are skilled, they are flexible with language, they're able to utilize the, what they've learned uh, locally and provide answers to the problems that customers of big global companies have. Those, uh, those uh, operations have restarted, so the value of that direction has now been realized. We've also uh, taken many of the learnings from that and incorporated in the regulations issued by the Minister of Employment and Labor, and that too was uh, publicly uh, announced. Let me come back, uh, come next to Jan's question on um, uh, price controls and uh, rising prices of basic foods. There are two challenges with rising prices. The first is when prices rise because your core costs have gone up. For example, if we buy wheat from elsewhere in the world, we import the wheat. When the rand is weaker, every um, ton of wheat costs more because the price is in dollar and as the rand uh, value declines against the dollar you need more rands to buy the same uh, quantity of wheat as you bought before now there's not much we can do about that because that's outside the control of anyone but there's a second reason why prices rise and that is because someone in the supply chain decides Here's a crisis, people are desperate, let's put up our prices because they don't have any alternative. 
when that is done, it is profoundly unfair to society uh, in circumstances where we're battling uh, a life or death crisis, where families have had the incomes slashed and so many workers have been with either a limited income or no income, when businesses have been on hold and some firms are staring uh, collapse in the face. In those circumstances, we really need to pull together. And so we are using our legislation, the uh, Competition Act, as well as the, uh, the credit uh, legislation, to act, um, uh, the consumer legislation rather, to act against companies uh, and middlemen who seek to exploit a temporary shortage by rapidly uh, uh, raising their prices. Tomorrow at the separate um, press conference for the economic sector, I will provide some information and data on the extent of actions by the authorities to deal with that. So we're keeping a careful price, uh, look at um, prices. The retailers and producers have said that they will not unnecessarily increase prices. And um, through uh, the various measures available to the state, we are, of course, monitoring what is happening there. Jan, on your question on special arrangements for the initial reopening of uh, liquor stores and places, well, we've done two things. The one is we have agreed that we would uh, enable the opening not just of the normal retailers that sell for off-consumption, that we'd also open more widely, as I indicated earlier, the taverns and shebeens and restaurants and so on that sell alcohol. But as I've indicated, it would only be for off-consumption uh, sale. In other words, in a sealed um, uh, uh, container, and it has to be uh, consumed at home. So that will hopefully reduce the number of um, uh, persons who come to any one place. We have asked the industry, we've said to them, we can either regulate this matter or you can self-regulate. They have indicated that they will take firm steps to reduce that rush, and I think we will hold them to that, and they will need to pull out all stops to make sure that there is not the kind of rush that we've seen elsewhere in the world when liquor stores uh, opened up. And uh, social distance will be absolutely critical, but we also call on South Africans um, to, uh, to cooperate uh, with each other very carefully to maintain the, the, the one and a half meter distance and to take every step to avoid uh, being, being infected. Uh, Evelyn asked the question on um, microfinance and the challenge of potential over-indebtedness. And Evelyn, like the example I gave earlier, uh, policy is about balancing different things. So in the case of uh, lending, either to small businesses or to individual consumers, there are two points of view. Our legislation at the moment uh, limits what can be done uh, if you recklessly lend as a microfinance player or as a bank or as a retail store selling on credit, you could effectively be held liable for that in that uh, if the person can't pay, uh, uh, you stand to lose that money. But in addition to that, there are remedies available in the law and we have in fact beefed up, uh, 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 Parliament has beefed up those remedies and there are uh, new provisions that will come into effect uh, at some point. We're now working, uh, working through the detail with industry. Now, if we, if we are too permissive, if the system is too permissive, uh, this is the danger of over-indebtedness. Every country faces this problem, particularly where there are large numbers of uh, low-income persons. Uh, and the burden sits then with individuals who are lured with easy loans uh, with enormous repayment uh, terms. If the legislation is too restrictive, then people who genuinely need uh, the support of a loan during a difficult and unusual period uh, would be deprived of it. So it's about finding the right balance. We looked at a number of different means to do this. The first was 
the legislation itself, the National Credit Act. Uh, it uh, has a requirement that um, uh, uh, lenders, people who lend money, uh, whether they are microfinance or big banks, by the way, they, there's, in both cases, there's always the, the challenge of over-indebtedness. But uh, uh, there's a requirement to act um, within the constraints of, uh, of prudence, uh, acting uh, appropriately, not um, uh, uh, enabling consumers to be so over indebted uh, <coughs> that they can never climb out of debt for the rest of their life. So there are two provisions in, in the legislation that can mitigate. So n the, the presumption, uh, uh, Evelyn, is that you, you, you should not act uh, and lend recklessly. The one provision gives the minister of trade, industry, and competition, the power to effectively designate that a certain category of agreements would be called public interest um, agreements. And that means the normal eligibility criteria don't apply. So you may be able to get a loan then, even though uh, your debt levels are high. The risk with that is it, it has a greater prospect of being abuse so because it could be open-ended. Mr. Patel, sorry for this disturbance. We have another press briefing at 17 hours. We are now left with how many minutes? 15. 15? Yeah. yeah. And she has a meeting at 5. But you don't have any questions now. Yeah, you might as well leave, yes. Yeah. So I was just saying, if we can round up so, uh, coming back then to this, uh, there is a second provision in the law, uh, uh, Evelyn, which enables emergency <coughs> loans for specified purposes to be given, and the National Credit Regulator has, uh, in fact, uh, taken steps uh, last week uh, to enable that. Uh, on your question of the repo uh, rate, uh, that's a function largely of the work of the Reserve Bank. On your question on taxation, uh, we have a very active Minister of Finance and he's spending time thinking through with uh, colleagues in Cabinet how best we deal with this. And I'm sure as and when he um, uh, announces the, uh, the budget, uh, the detail will be, will be set out uh, in more detail. I thought you were saying he's spending time in the so uh, I'm uh, I'm not going to uh, uh, respond to the just, just uh, ignore uh, that uh, <laughs> that one the the witticism by the minister of uh, justice uh, and we as we we greet uh, our colleague we had to leave yeah. so I think that that covers the issue um, on the question that came up earlier on on hot foods uh, on all of these issues it's a matter of some degree of judgment that have to be placed in these things. There is no perfect science in it. It's trying to see how can we make sure that the aggregate level of, of things that happen don't contribute to a rapid spread of the virus. Uh, I think there was uh, a, um, a question that we didn't hear from Finweek, so uh, I think the, the caller got cut off. There was, I, I don't know what the question on parks and beaches uh. Uh, the, the question from Finwick was with regards to um, people being allowed to visit family uh, and basically the question is based on if some people are allowed to go to church for spiritual and psychological well-being, um, why can't other people who need that from their family go and visit their families for the same purpose? Well, I, I think the, the, the way the, the regulations and the directions stand now is that we can visit our families in the neighborhood. The only problem is when we must go beyond the province where we live and the district and the metro where we live. For the purpose of visiting our families, if there is a need, yes, we can still get permit. Uh, to go and visit our families if whatever need has arisen for us to visit them. 
because we are not living in normal times. Now that, that, that's the other issue that all of us should really take to heart. These are not normal times. These are COVID-19 times where we need to take every precaution to save ourselves from infections, but also to ensure that we also don't become infectors ourselves. So I think what my colleagues have said, ultimately, we must all adapt to these times, ultimately, all of us. Uh, it, it cannot only be a government regulations and government uh, directions that will guide our behavior uh, around this uh, terrible pandemic. You know, we know that so many thousands, thousands and thousands throughout the world have died because of this pandemic. But equally, we have got many people in our own country who have also died because of this pandemic. Therefore, the measures that we are taking, again, as our, our, the ministers have said, are meant to save lives. Ultimately, all these measures we are taking around movements, all these measures we are taking around the health protocols and hygiene protocols, all these measures are meant to save lives. They are not just a nuisance to our people, no. They also affect all of us because we have a responsibility to stay safe, as our slogan says, and protect South Africa. And all of us have that responsibility. That's why then these regulations and the directions. Minister Lamon. I just wanted to add that um, on this point that Minister Mtembu has been uh, alluding to, one of the key considerations we are looking at is the fact that there are these hot spots which are already red. And the Minister Lamini said that this is where our economic activities are mostly happening. So as we deal with this issue of differentiated levels to alert level 2 and 1, we are grappling with the issue of how then do you minimize the risk of these hotspots transferring the disease to the non-hotspots in the various rural areas of our country. Hence, we have remained with some level of, uh, of, of, of restriction with regard to movement to, at this stage, manage that issue of uh, cross-pollination between the metros or these red uh, hotspot areas into the other areas which are not uh, hotspots but as information and data becomes more available it will also help us as we deal with the differentiated approach and we ease uh, in the areas where it is not hotspots to allow for more uh, easing of the restrictions thank you thank you very much colleagues that 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 basically brings us to the end uh, of this media briefing we we, we want to assure south africans that we will, as we approach whatever level, including level three, uh, we will keep on updating all of South Africa. What are the measures we are taking? What are the regulations we are putting in place? And what informs those regulations? But as colleagues will also know, as our media will also know, we have also, as ministers have said, consulted broadly, uh, not only with labor or community organizations and the business, but we have also consulted with political organizations that are represented in parliament. We have consulted with our traditional leaders. We have consulted with our, <coughs> with our faith-based faith organizations so that whatever direction we take as government is also informed by these consultations. So we, we are quite happy that as we proceed to level three on the 1st of June next Monday, we have indeed been given the necessary green light by many stakeholders in our country uh, to proceed to that level. But more important is that, you know, government will not be able to police 
over 57 million people in our country. Ultimately, the responsibility to say, stay safe and the responsibility to protect our loved ones against this pandemic, the responsibility to protect our families, the responsibility to protect our communities rests on our shoulders. As Madiba said, uh, it is up to us, as also as our president said, we must do whatever it takes to protect ourselves, to protect our families, and to protect our communities against this deadly disease. With these words, thank you very much. I know that it's now almost five o'clock. We have another briefing lined up by the JCPS cluster. See you now, now.